Everybody. Welcome to Serpente Sunday for October 29th, 2023. I'm Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Animal Sanctuary. And this week I want to give you just a few reminders of what choice-based interactions look like and how that works into choice-based handling, which is what you're seeing right here. It should look pretty familiar with TC. And it involves a lot of approach and retreat, a lot of just walking around and doing normal daily activities around the snake's enclosure, and then a lot of opening the door and seeing what happens. In TC's case, he's always ready to come out, except maybe when he's in shed. So here's an example of me doing that exercise with our Maclots Python, Shran. So I came in after checking horses, that's why I have my coat on. This room's actually very warm. And I just opened his door because he was at the door and I wait. And he's looking at me and I'm looking at him and he's not moving. So I decide to go ahead and move away and do some other things in the room, check some other snakes and give him some time to decide if he wants to come out or not. And on this particular evening, he did not come out, but that hasn't always been the case. And it's not the case on the next evening or night that I'm about to show you. And this is how choice-based interactions and passive and active habituation go sometimes. Now, this is another example where he was at his door and he was obviously being a lot more active. And I opened the door and he actually is starting to come out over the threshold. And in cases like this, I just wait for him to come all the way out or almost all the way out. And then if he is going into areas around the outside of his enclosure that he shouldn't be in, I gently redirect him. And then if there's an opportunity for me to pick him up using considerate approach and using a touch gradient and he's not becoming distressed about it and he's tolerating it pretty well we do a short handling session this is another night where i had just come in from the barn so i'm filthy and i have the smells of horses all over me and barn cats all over me and grain and hay and whatever else is out there and i'm cold even though his room is very warm and he did really really well he didn't seem bothered by any of those smells that were on me. And we had a really productive introduction to handling session where we learned to trust each other a little bit. And I didn't hold him for very long, maybe 30 seconds or one minute. And then when he started to want to move away, I allowed him to do that. And he started to move over towards his enclosure, but not in his enclosure. He likes to crawl around the outside of his enclosure and often he likes to crawl on top of his enclosure. And so as long as it's safe to allow him to do that, I let him do that. Now this is the enclosure directly across from Shran. This is Kazuda. And I wanted to show you this because he is our largest Morelia Bradley. He shouldn't be this large if you look at his head size compared to body size and our veterinarian advises that he's a little bit overweight. He has just been recently relinquished. He's five years old. He's a stonewashed Morelia Bradley and he is bigger than he should be for his age and head size. He's about seven and a half feet long. He's in an eight by two by two enclosure that I put together by attaching two dubia cages. Keep in mind that black box enclosures does sell eight by two by two enclosures as does focus cubed habitats. And those are the two white PVC style enclosures that I recommend. And if you're looking for an economy way to do a giant enclosure, check out Dubia because you can attach these together end to end pretty much as many as you have space for in your room. Initiating choice-based interactions is gonna look like a lot of opening doors and just standing and walking around with the doors open. It's gonna be a lot of watching your snake and allowing your snake to watch you and not being intrusive into their enclosure and not forcing yourself on them as far as handling goes. It means that you're gonna open doors, you're gonna give snakes opportunities to interact with the environment outside of their enclosure. And if they come out, you're gonna allow them some time to explore on their own before you start touching them, before you start grabbing them, and before you expect them to interact with you, as long as it's safe to do that. Sometimes you're gonna luck out 
and the snake is gonna come out of their enclosure. And here's an example of a baby Brettles python coming out of a transport tub. And they're gonna just choose to climb onto you. They're gonna choose to climb onto your hand. They're gonna choose to investigate you as well as the rest of their environment. Remember that you are just part of the environment. Sometimes they're gonna do approach and retreat and you should also do approach and retreat based on your snake's behavior. This is gonna take some trust on your part and also some trial and error. Snakes have teeth, they don't know you yet, they're investigating you. Part of that investigation is tongue flicking and if they get confused and think that you might be food or if they get confused and think you might be dangerous, it is possible for them to bite you and you just have to let this process take place while being as safe as you possibly can. You can start by just waiting and allowing the snake to initiate contact with you first, allowing the snake to come to you, and making sure that you give the snake no reason to feel that you are a threat or a danger to them and give them no reason to think you are food. Now, please remember that we don't know exactly how much snakes are able to integrate things in their brain. As far as when they look at a whole person or a whole dog or a whole room, how well are they able to integrate the parts of the whole and understand that your hand and your arm is part of the rest of you, your torso, your head, your body. It may be that even though the snake is climbing on you and crawling on you and tongue flicking the rest of your body when they get to your arm or when they get to your hand or when they get to your finger or when they get to your earlobe, they may not realize that that's part of the thing that they're climbing on and they may become afraid of it and strike or they may think, hmm, warm flesh, maybe this is food. I'd also be climbing on one part of your body and if they're far enough away from your face or another part of the body, they may get frightened when they see it. And I've had that happen with one of my little baby Morelia Bradley where she was climbing on my hand and arm voluntarily, but I was holding it away from me. And when she turned and looked at my face, it startled her and she struck out in the air in the direction of my face. So again, I don't know how well they understand all of the parts of us are part of a whole, we need to just be patient with them and allow them this process to learn. They may also be interacting with you by choice and interacting with the environment outside of their enclosure by choice or even in an exercise space or tent and then suddenly become startled and frightened and they may flee. They may not strike out. They may turn around and retreat and look for some place to hide. That's okay too. Allow that process to happen as long as it's not dangerous for the snake and if they don't calm down within a reasonable amount of time, a few seconds, and go from the yellow zone back to the green zone behaviors, which means relatively comfortable and relaxed and in an exploratory mode, then you wanna make sure that they are placed back in a safe environment where they feel comfortable and where it's familiar to them. What I've gone over in this video has been choice-based interactions and introducing those by passive habituation or mostly by observation and passive activities. A more active form of habituation would be something like target training with your snake or station training with your snake. And you can also do puzzle feeding, which is sort of a combination of passive habituation and active habituation because you are actively setting up a puzzle feeding exercise for them or a forging exercise for them. And oftentimes you're standing by while they engage in it but you're pretty much hands off. You're not really directing them as to what to do. I wanna leave you with a reminder that choice-based interactions, including choice-based handling, are things that we do when there's not an emergency situation. And by providing the snakes with more agency and at times by giving them actual control over their environments and choices they make in their daily lives, Choice-based interactions can help reduce stress, improve well-being, and foster a more positive relationship and a trusting relationship between snakes and their caretakers. For more information about choice-based interactions, including choice-based handling, and for information about how to use the least intrusive, minimally aversive principles, as well as gradual desensitization, 
all of which are concepts that are very much part of choice-based interactions, please check out the choice-based handling playlist as well as the gradual desensitization playlist. And I have a Lima playlist, that's L-I-M-A. And until next time, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals.